Hey everybody, today I wanted to show you uh, basically my process for doing a closed transfer into a corny K. Uh, now this is as close as you can get it to a commercial brewing environment. Uh, obviously at the pro level we have um, uh, a little more advanced fermenters and uh, better connections and different kegs. So it's a lot easier to do, uh, but uh, this will actually get you pretty close. And, and this is honestly a, a very, very close environment with very minimal uh, oxygen pickup if you uh, follow this method. So uh, before I get into that though, I want to talk about um, dissolved oxygen, oxidation, etc. And uh, what that actually means to you as a home brewer. Um, so if you look at a lot of literature, literature out there uh, in home brewing and dissolved oxygen, it'll tell you um, pretty much that if you have uh, dissolved oxygen or pickup uh, either in your cold side or hot side um, that the way that I identify that is by a cardboard, wet cardboard kind of uh, flavor uh, that comes through in your beer. Uh, though that is, that is correct, uh, I'm here to tell you today that that is only one flavor compound, only one reaction that happens out of about a dozen uh, different reactions that can happen depending on where that, that pickup is, ha is, uh, is created. Uh, the most common one that I get um, is actually like a, a sweetness, like a sickly sweetness, um, either like a sherry-like sweetness or like a, uh, like a really heavy like caramel malt kind of flavor. Um, that's pretty common. Uh, the other really common thing is either a slight uh, or a, a dramatic color change in your beer. Uh, you see that a lot with, with New England IPAs, just because the starting color of the beer, or the SRM, is usually so light that um, any, any pickup really, really shows itself. Uh, and then finally, uh, like on the aroma side, like you'll get, like I get, um, it's like a staleness that kind of comes through. I, I can't really explain it other than that, but just kind of everything like is a little more dull and, and just not as vibrant as, as it should be. But the, the sweetness is definitely the, the most uh, common one, the sweetness and the color change. Uh, and so if you're experiencing anything like that, you know, you keg off your beer and you taste it and you're like, oh wow, this is really good. And then a couple days later, that fit flavor changes, you know, and even if you can't put your finger on it, um, that is, that could be from, from oxidation. So just bear that in mind. A uh, quick, couple quick stats for you. Uh, so the atmosphere is 21% oxygen roughly. Uh, that translates to about eight parts per million um, uh, uh, dissolved oxygen. If you were to take, for example, a cup of water or beer or whatever um, and shake it until the uh, oxygen equalizes in solution or in that, that beer, uh, and you read uh, that oxygen level with a meter, you would get eight parts per million. So that's the maximum possible that it could be without just adding pure oxygen. Um, in brewing, uh, commercially, we shoot for less than 50 parts per billion uh, dissolved oxygen in, pa in package. Um, but uh, you'll see you'll see massive signs uh, of uh, of oxidation uh, with numbers as low as one parts per million. Uh, and I want to tell you, you know, after after doing a significant amount of research into this uh, uh, as the, the packaging guy at the brewery. Uh, I can tell you that pickup is very, very easy. Uh, you know, every little um, uh, a part per billion that you can shave off is gonna make a better beer. Um, so when when I uh, uh, basically do this process, I'm doing it uh, so that I'm having as little dissolved oxygen in, in my keg and in my finished product as possible. So uh, let's go on to parts really quick because that's the most important part. Uh, it's really quite simple. So first of all, um, if you have a, a glass carboy um, and you're looking to change, I would highly recommend a uh, for Monster. These guys, I think, are like 35 bucks. Uh, they're plastic. Um, they're super light. Uh, they've got this lid up here that unscrews. So if you need, like, put you know some crazy uh, addition in there, like whole peaches or I don't know avocados or something, like you've got plenty of room to actually get those in there. Um, and then the top has. Uh, a hole in there for just the rubber stopper. Uh, and the best part is you can put a spigot on them. Um, and this spigot is totally a game changer for my cold side. Uh, it allows me to pull samples and, and all kinds of stuff, take really uh, easy gravity readings without uh, you know dipping something in there and the pour stuff. Um, highly, highly, highly recommended. Uh, if you do use a glass carboy, there are um, uh, special tops that you can get. 
uh, that have basically two connections that you can make. So you can have uh, gas on one side and then kind of a dip tube that goes into uh, the beer on the other side. And that does allow you to push things, but the problem with that is like you have to take the thing off and then uh, put that on and like all that, that, that time and process, you're basically adding oxygen into your beer. Uh, and that dissolved oxygen, uh, or oxygen can dissolve into beer extremely rapidly, um, within a matter of minutes, uh, especially, uh, with or without yeast in the package, actually. Um, so, uh, parts, basically, take this guy off. So I've got um, a rubber stopper, but let me talk about that for a minute. Uh, you want a rubber stopper that the rubber is nice and soft, uh, like the ones that are like super hard and you can't even really squish. Uh, those aren't really good uh, seals for, for keeping um, pressure in or, or oxygen out. Uh, it's going to leak right through the side somewhere. So you want to find one that's you know nice and kind of rubbery and pliable. Uh, these things as they get older will actually get pretty stiff and, and when they get to that point you just want to toss them to get a new one. Uh, the other key component is um, this guy. And this I found at my local homebrew store, uh, and it was I think like 10 or 12 bucks or something. Uh, but it's just a double-sided ball valve, uh, double barbed, excuse me, uh, ball valve. And what this allows me to do is just basically like keep a closed environment in my fermenter. So uh, I put this on basically from the very beginning of fermentation. So I, I you know, fill up my, my fermenter uh, with wort, uh, pitch my yeast, uh, I'll close this all off, put this guy in here, um, and then I, I'll I actually attach my blow off uh, just right to um, this guy and into my blow off bucket there. Uh, and I'll leave that open uh, during fermentation. And so when I need to pull a sample, you know, I'll just close that off, pull my sample so I don't get any negative pressure and need to suck back into it. Uh, wait, you know, 30 seconds to a minute for the pressure to build up again. Uh, open that up and then you continue by bubbling up the, the top there. Uh, so it has many, many advantages beyond just just uh, uh, kegging. But um, I highly recommend something like this. And, and oddly enough, like even though it's just a rubber stopper and this thing's you know kind of loose in there, it actually holds pressure fairly well and keeps um, uh, oxygen stuff from getting in. So, uh, but after uh, fermentation's done, basically I'll close that off. Uh, I cold crash my beer. Um, so I'll take this guy off, uh, put the um, brewery line, or the CO2 line, excuse me, uh, on there. Just put like one or two pressure uh, pounds of uh, pressure on it so that uh, when I cold crash it, it doesn't totally suck in and implode. Um, but anyway, so that's, that's the primary thing that makes it really, really possible to super easy and keep oxygen out of your uh, fermenter pretty much the entire process. Uh, there's a process for, for keeping oxygen out when you're dry hopping, you gotta actually open it up, but I'm gonna save that for another video. Uh, so the spigot, I talked about the importance of the spigot, makes that you know transferring really easy. Um, and then the third final piece is uh, just a couple feet of, of uh, uh, beer draft line, um, a uh, corny coupler, and then a uh, barbed post for that. Um, between you know this guy and this and, and this guy, I think it's like you're probably looking at like maybe 25 bucks ish. Uh, so really, really uh, easy to do as far as expense wise. So uh, finally, let me talk about process. So uh, first thing that I do is you know I take my beer out of the cooler. Uh, it's been cr cr totally crashed. Um, beer's very bright, very clear. Uh, I don't have any, you know, particulates or anything floating around in there. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll actually set it right here where it's at now. Uh, I'll take my uh, CO2 line and I'll turn it on um, at my regulator, which is over there. Ta -da. Uh, and I turn the regulator just ever so slightly uh, to where the needle doesn't even really move, uh, but I can hear like a slight hissing coming out of here. Um, so really it's like maybe a PSI, maybe less, but very, very minimal. Um, so once I do that, uh, I turn, you know, open the gas up, turn that on, uh, hear the, the gas coming out of here, I'm purging this line of oxygen, uh, then I come over here and with this guy closed, I'll actually go ahead and uh, just kind of jam it onto this barb. And I've got a, a little guy here just to make sure that it doesn't come popping off 
uh, makes it really, really handy uh, if you've got something just to secure it up there. Uh, definitely recommend that. So the next thing I'll do is, um, you know, I don't have this guy connected quite yet, and my keg is not quite prepped yet. But uh, make this connection. I'll open up my valve very, very slowly. And I'm listening just to hear like if there's going to be any leaks or um, you know, I'm looking at the, uh, the vessel itself, making sure that it's not swelling up too much. Uh, because uh, as you probably know, these are not rated for any kind of pressure. So you want to be very, very careful when pressurizing this or any other kind of vessel because uh, if that regulator is broken or something and, and too much pressure goes in there, this will most certainly explode and cause uh, injury or harm to you. Uh, but if you're really careful about it, uh, it's uh, uh, it, it's definitely uh, it makes the, the process really easy and lets it keeps the uh, uh, oxygen out. So uh, I've done this um, for a couple of years now, uh, this kind of method, and um, found it to be very very successful. And uh, I haven't had anything explode on me yet. Knock on wood. So we're, I don't know over here. Um, so this guy is now pressurized. Uh, it's good to go. My spigot's off. Uh, I'll take this guy, you know, uh, uh, make sure it's been sanitized, um, and connect it to my spigot here. Uh, and again, having another clamp or something down here is, is also really, really helpful. Um, because it just keeps this thing from popping off and making a mess. So once that's done, uh, I'll open this just ever so slightly. And at the same time, I'll open the um, uh, the valve at the bottom of this post here, uh, or coupler here, uh, just to purge, you know, fill this up completely with beer um, and purge any oxygen that's in there as well. And I'll usually do that into like a little bowl or a bucket or something. And then once that's done, uh, I'll again spray it out with uh, uh, sanitizer just to make sure it's a sanitary, sanitary connection. Uh, finally, the, uh, the last thing that uh, I do, and, and I usually do this before, but uh, the last thing I'll double check is that my keg is completely purged of oxygen. Now there's a couple different methods of doing this. Um, I've found that, that uh, burst purging uh, is usually the most effective. And so how you do that is basically uh, you fill the keg uh, three times uh, at about 12 psi. And uh, so you fill it once, you, you know, hear the gas stop, you take the coupler off, uh, and then you completely purge that guy with the PRV or the pressure release valve up top, this little springy thingy. Um, and then you do that two more times. Uh, and at the third time, when you open that guy up, uh, you want to give it the sniff test. And so basically what you're looking for is, uh, you know, you kind of put your nose there uh, and open it up and just kind of smell it. And uh, when it's close to or, or pretty much pure CO2, uh, it's going to be really strong. Uh, it'll, make, it'll make your eyes water just a little bit, uh, and you know when you, when you smell it in, it'll kind of make you like recoil a little bit. Uh, if you get to that point, you know that, that it's, it's pretty much completely purged and there's, there's little to no oxygen in there, uh, and that's what you're looking for. Um, so once this guy is completely purged, uh, and depressurized because uh, remember we only have like maybe half a psi on our fermenter here so if this isn't depressurized and we couple it and everything's open all that pressure is going to go blow right back into our fermenter uh, it's going to blow all that stuff up off the bottom and get our, uh, our nice beautiful clear beer uh, all gunked up again so completely depressurized is absolutely key so uh, this guy has been um, completely purged it's full of beer uh, my uh, spigot's open, uh, this guy's open, I have you know, just a tiny, tiny bit of, of pressure on there. Uh, and uh, again, just double check this is purged. Uh, I'll go ahead and couple it to my liquid post. And the reason I do that is because I've got a dip tube that's going all the way down to the very bottom of that keg. And it allows us to fill that keg from the very bottom upwards, um, giving a very, very nice gentle fill. Uh, and that gentle fill is going to make sure that, you know, any oxygen that might be in there uh, is not going to have a chance to really get mixed into uh, the majority of that beer. Uh, it, it'll only be in contact with that, that thin surface layer of, of the liquid. And so what's going to happen is you're going to notice, you know, the beer kind of will flow in there like fairly quickly at first, uh, but then it's going to like slow down and slow down and slow down almost to a stop. And what's happening is the pressure here 
and the pressure here are equalizing. And once the pressure equalizes, uh, you're not getting a lot of movement um, from here to here. So what do you do next? Well, again, we looked at that PRV to basically change that pressure in the keg and allow that flow to continue. So a lot of people don't realize this, but the, the PRV that are on top of these guys, you know, the little springy thing, uh, it actually unscrews. Uh, and it's really good to unscrew this thing, especially when you're cleaning it, because stuff can get in there and it gets really gunked up and really, really gross. But um, if you unscrew this guy, uh, just ever so slightly, and of course I tighten mine super tight and now it's not unscrewing. <laughs> Seriously, hold on, guys. Ah, there we go. Okay, so if you unscrew this guy ever so slightly, uh, if you get it to a certain point, you'll hear a little hiss. Um, and that hiss means that the pressure is coming out of here, uh, which means that the beer, the liquid, can transfer into here. And so now what you've done uh, is you've created basically this is your flow rate limiter. So the faster that hiss goes, the faster that beer is going to go in there. Uh, the slower that hiss goes, the slower. Um, and now you don't want it to go super slow because we don't want to stand there under for, for two hours, like basically waiting for a keg to fill. Um, but what I do is I basically turn it until I can hear that hiss um, fairly well from the distance that I'm standing down. Uh, if it's you know super quiet and I'm like oh is it hissing or not like oh I don't know like that's you're, you're gonna be flowing your keg way too slow so I'll just kind of just adjust this ever so slightly get a nice little hiss out of there a good flow into the the keg and a nice gentle fill again from the bottom up now uh, if this was a commercial brewery I would fill this keg up all the way to the top until the beer was actually till the foam came out completely and I was getting beer out of my um, my pressure release valve here. Uh, because this is my house and I don't have floor drains, um, I, it's not quite as easy to do that. And I'm usually only kegging off five gallons anyway. So to get all those five gallons in here, I either have to brew a big batch or whatever. Long story short, uh, I'm probably only gonna be able to get my keg filled to, you know, maybe an inch or two from the top. And that leaves a lot of potential for, you know, any, any oxygen that happened to be in there from an ineffective purge uh, to, you know, especially once you start carbonating it, uh, dissolve into solution and give you some, some DO pickup. Um, so what we do at that point, so I've, I've completely filled my keg, I'm out of beer, uh, I'll, you know, take the post off, uh, I'll close this guy. Uh, and I'll take my gas off as quickly as possible and I'll turn it off at my regulator because you don't want that thing just to be like filling up with oxygen and over pressurizing, you know, some issues can potentially happen from that. So I'll take all this stuff off, set it aside, uh, and then this guy I'll take my um, gas post on my, uh, uh, bleh, on my um, CO2 uh, tank, um, take my gas coupler, uh, again, do the same thing with the, the, the triple purge. So 10 to 12 PSI through the gas post and um, just, you know, bleed it out, fill it up again, bleed it out, fill it up again, bleed it out. Uh, and that ensures that I've got as much oxygen out of there as, as, as possible. Um, and between uh, filling gently, pre-purging the keg and post-purging the keg, you'll ensure that your oxygen levels are extremely minimal. Uh, now, there is one thing that I want to point out uh, that is a disadvantage uh, to this method. So, uh, let's say you are, are filling this beer and uh, it's like a massive dry hop or you've got like, I don't know, like some crazy amount of stone fruit in there or whatever. And you've got a lot of little floaties in there. Uh, those little floaties are probably gonna clog the post here. Uh, and it will make transferring very, very difficult. So, um, I, uh, I, I, the way that I combat that is to make sure my beer is fully crashed, uh, and I won't package until basically it's completely bright, um, or at least that you know I'm not seeing any any particulates floating around in there. Um, if that is not a possibility, uh, and you absolutely have to fill from the lid or you know opening up the lid and, and such. Uh, I want to tell you the proper way of doing that. Um, a lot of times I'll see uh, setups you know, online where they have a tube in there and it maybe goes down to like halfway point, it's kind of dripping in there. 
Uh, or they'll like put the keg on its side and the tube, you know, so it like streams down the side there. Uh, I want to tell you here now that both of those methods uh, will give you a massive amount of dissolved oxygen pickup. Um, the proper way of doing it uh, is to have a, a tube that goes all the way down to the bottom there and is sitting as, as flat against the bottom as possible. And when you start that transfer, so again, this is a lid off situation, uh, you start that transfer, you want it to be as gentle as possible. And you want to continue for it to be as gentle as possible uh, until you get the top of that tube uh, covered completely in beer. Uh, at that point, you can speed the transfer up uh, as fast as you can um, without disturbing the surface of, of the beer. So obviously those first few inches, you know, you're going to want to go slow. Uh, when you get up to here, uh, you can go fairly fast. Uh, but the other thing you want to make sure that you're not doing is creating any sort of like whirlpool um, because that will also actually suck oxygen in as well. Uh, crazy thing, dissolved oxygen, like the pickup potential uh, at every point is, is really, really high. Um, and then of course, once you get the uh, keg filled all the way, uh, then you know, do the triple purge thing, make sure you try and get all the air out of there as quickly as possible. Um, and uh, that's, that's the only other way of, of really getting this thing filled. Now I'll tell you that I brewed a ton uh, last summer. I did a lot of hoppy beers and such. Uh, and I only had one instance where I actually clogged the post. Uh, but again, I'm also cold crashing my beer to get all of that sediment and stuff to flocculate or fall to the bottom. Um, and I'm cold crashing it at like 32 degrees. So if you can't do that, um, maybe transferring to a secondary or something, but so just keep that in mind. Uh, it definitely takes a little more of a, a, a kind of an eye to, to make sure that the beer is clear enough to go in there. Um, that's pretty much it. Uh, if you guys have any questions, hit me up on Instagram, uh, at HelloChris, uh, or of course leave uh, comments below. But uh, again, you know, thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate it. Uh, again, I'm going to try and do more videos uh, now that things are slowing down a little bit. And if you have any ideas for me, let me know. Thank you. Thank you.